Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this uh, lecture series. Um, <clears throat> my name is Salwa, as uh, Wesley has uh, mentioned. Um, I've worked on uh, lighting design uh, for um, about 25 plus years, probably. Um, I've worked on uh, almost every sector and project type uh, you can think of, from uh, residential to um, commercial office buildings, from K through 12 schools to higher education, from civic projects to healthcare, hospitality and retail, and even places of worship to public parks and sports arenas. Um, today, we're going to journey through the art of lighting, um, and in doing so, we will be touching on some uh, learning objectives. Uh, first, we'll go through, uh, very briefly, through some of the fundamentals of architectural lighting design. Uh, we will learn about the seven domains of practice for the lighting design professional. Uh, we will also learn a little bit about the design process as practiced in the industry today. And lastly, we'll, uh, we'll touch uh, very briefly on a few hot uh, topics of today, which are sustainability, health, and wellness through lighting. Um, and uh, you know, before delve, diving into the profession of lighting design, I'd like to start with a um, quick introduction to the fundamentals of lighting. Um, Gary Steffi, who's, who's a renowned lighting educator, describes lighting as a problem moving around people, how they feel, how they react and function in various settings. Um, lighting has a psych, uh, physiological component as well as a psychological one. Um, one of the physiological components is, uh, we'll start with adaptation. Um, as you see in the figure here, adaptation uh, for, the, is for the visual system to be able to function well, uh, it has to be adapted to the prevailing light condition. Um, the human eye can actually uh, process a really vast range of luminances, uh, much higher than you, you know, the most advanced cameras, um, but not all at once. So to cope with this very wide range of illumination, from a dark night, which uh, measures about uh, 0 point, uh, 0 0.01 lux, which is, lux is a measure of light, um, from 0 0.01 to a sunlit beach, which is 100,000 lux. Um, so the visual changes its sensitivity uh, through the process of adaptation. And um, this happens through various processes. One of them is mechanically with the eye kind of constricting and dilating, uh, photochemically, which is a process that involves, um, involves photopigments within the eye or through a neural change. And that's the most common one, uh, which is a very subtle process that our eye is going through constantly when we're looking around in a uh, interior space, the, you know, varying the different levels of uh, lighting that we're looking at. Um, another component of the physiological uh, factors is called accommodation. And this is, a, um, this is a process through which the eye or the lens of the eye is, uh, changes its shape to focus, uh, you know, to provide better focusing power. And that's for things that are, this is actually, I'm sorry, this is the, the, the diagram that we're looking at here. You see the, the shape of the lens changes. Um, when we're trying to focus on something that's near and, and something that's far. Um, and accommodation is important because it leads us to the next component, which is uh, aging. So um, in older adults, this focus power and flexibility becomes a little constricted. Basically, uh, an older person's eye is less flexible which means it gets more difficult in uh, lower light levels, and this results in blurred vision and eye strain. Um, <clears throat> um, we're looking now at you know, this image here, um, circadian rhythms. And this is a very hot topic, uh, and, and it's actually a topic for a whole day, but here's a quick rundown of it. Um, circadian rhythms are biological rhythms, that uh, repeat approximately every 24 hours. 
So they affect body temperature, sleep and wakefulness, various hormonal changes, um, and light, and more specifically, um, what we would call the spectral distribution of light, basically the breakdown of the different wavelengths. And I don't want to get too technical here, but um, the, these wavelengths of light are the main stimulus that helps regulate the circadian clock or circadian uh, light-dark cycle. And it keeps the rhythm, rhythms synchronized uh, based on the geographical time. Uh, and without getting too technical again, um, there's certain cells called retinal ganglion cells. Uh, these are the, you know, these are the cells that receive light and transmit the signals to the light sensitive neurons. And that's where the light entrainment occurs. Um, what the reason we're mentioning this is disrupting these rhythms can have really adverse effects on biological functions and actually has been linked to uh, chronic uh, diseases uh, like diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and certain cancers even. Um, and it also predisposes the individuals to a wide range of mood and behavioral disorders, uh, even leading to depression. And um, science has not fully uncovered the, the the, the actual the reason for this, but for now it's a uh, very uh, well proven scientific correlation. Um, and 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 this is for you know based on my healthcare experience, health healthcare lighting experience, and studies have linked poor survival rates in uh, certain cancers uh, for patients who have an altered um, circadian rhythm. Uh, like flight attendants or night shift workers. So really, um, it's really critical to embrace, you know, lighting strategies that work in harmony with these rhythms. And this also, you know, uh, segues into SAD, seasonal affective disorder, which is, you know, a, a variation of this and, uh, or basically what we know as winter depression. We don't know it here in California but um, a lot of Eastern or Northern states um, have uh, a widespread occurrence of, of this. Uh, approximately 10 to 25 million people have uh, symptoms associated with uh, this uh, winter depression, which is uh, a factor um, uh, which is associated with reduced exposure to daylight. Um, so this is, this uh, this, you know, wraps up the physiological um, components. Um, <clears throat> the psychological components, these are the more fun ones and, you know, the more artsy <laughs> uh, version of things. Um, so lighting design shouldn't be limited to functional tasks and physiological needs. Obviously we need a certain level of light to be able to see physically and we need, you know, um, we need certain uh, spectral distributions to function health in a healthy way, but you know, that's not all um, that lighting design is about. Um, good lighting should address all the qualitative factors affecting the user's attitude and preferences and motivation. Um, so the first one is perception by the observer. And this is very, you know, subjective, obviously. Uh, this includes attraction and, you know, uh, subjective impressions. Um, visual attraction can occur through enhancing colors of objects or uh, surfaces in the environment or textures or adding depth or enhancing architectural form. Um, this, the other component is location, uh, distribution and intensity of light. So when you enter a room, where does the designer want you to focus on? And how do they address your peripheral, vi peripheral vision? Um, I mean, you can look at this um, photo, for example, um, you're immediately focused at the element, the art element that's in the center of the photo, um, because, you know, it's, it's, the focal point of this uh, image here. And then we have the, uh, on the peripheral, we have these accented elements, um, which kind of, you know, uh, frame the peripheral of the room. And uh, there's basically multiple layers of light that, you know, comprise this composition. Um, 
And, uh, you know, there's a method to things uh, for attraction, for example, um, you want to use a contrast ratio of three to one. So, you know, there's ways of measuring the light intensity. And if you want to create interest, you know, the intensity of the objects that you're highlighting want to be, you know, three to one, uh, the object to the background. Uh, if you want to create a focal point, for example, like the uh, the uh, like the uh, tree element here in this uh, room, um, now you have to increase that contrast to ten to one. So basically, uh, the visual hierarchies in in the space will compose the the lighting scene. Other uh, fundamentals about you know, quality of light that I'd like to uh, just quickly go over before, you know, jumping into a project is um, one is called color temperature. Obviously, uh, you're looking here at this, uh, let me use my pointer and, and oops, sorry. <clears throat> um, so we're looking here at different colors of light and these are colors that are, you know, present in nature. So we have the 2000 Kelvin, which is, you know, the very warm candlelight color, and you're going through the 3000 and the 4000. This is the range that's typical in interior spaces. And then, you know, we're going out to uh, 5,000, 6,500 Kelvin. It's something that, um, uh, that you see under blue sky, for example. Um, and, and color temperature, it's uh, it's called temperature because it's the relationship of the color of the light to a theoretical standardized material called the black uh, body radiator. Basically, this is a perfect body that when it glows, uh, it glows in this, uh, it starts glowing in this amber color. And every time you increase the temperature, it starts glowing brighter and more, you know, towards the blue colors or blue spectrum. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a theoretical, uh, you know, object, but that's how we measure the color temperature. Um, and basically the color of the light is correlated to the Kelvin temperature, um, uh, which, you know, uh, which theoretically this body is heated to. Um, the second element or the second, um, aspect of, uh, lighting is called CRI. And uh, CRI is a measure of, you know, the ability of a light source to accurately rep reproduce colors of the objects it, um, it's illuminating. Um, in this figure here, we're looking at um, uh, sheets of color, and we're looking at them through different lenses of light. Um, so CRI of 90 is a very high, high quality, high, high CRI light. And uh, CRI of 60 is a very low quality of light. So this is the same, these are the same objects. You're looking at them through different uh, light sources. And you'll see that the colors are not true on the upper uh, line here. And they get more deeper and more uh, realistic or more true as you go down uh, on the CRI, basically, or, or up technically on the CRI. So um, <clears throat> lighting is both an art and a science. You know, now that we've pretty you know, much gone through a very, very quick you know, overview of the fundamentals of light, um, how do we approach the lighting design process? Um, so there are you know, multiple ways to approach the lighting design. You have the engineered process or the engineered approach. And this is a, you know, uh, this is a, an approach that addresses the code requirements because, you know, in real life, you know, lighting is based on code requirements. Um, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's certain light fixtures that have to be specified that need to meet these criteria, like, you know, thinking of, uh, we're in California here, thinking of something called Title 24, which is um, a huge part of the energy code for California, or the uh, IBC, which is the um, International Building Code that, you know, this one um, addresses egress illumination. How can people ex exit the building? Um, you know, there's requirements for that. And then uh, there's also life safety codes, 
which address emergency illuminations. And this is, you know, in case of emergency, when the power goes out, what happens to people? How do they leave a building? So these are kind of like the engineered, you know, elements that need to be satisfied before anything else. Uh, and then the second, you know, approach is the hard science approach, which is, you know, a lot of the things, the physiological aspects that we just spoke, talked about. Um, and this is, uh, you know, uh, there's, you know, all kinds of criteria to, to meet target light levels for, you know, for visual tasks. You have, you know, if you're doing reading or writing in, in a space, you have to, um, you have to provide a certain level of light. You know, if you're doing, if you're watching uh, a movie, there's a certain level of light. If you're performing surgery, there's a different level of light, you know. Um, if you're in a conference room, it's different than when you're in an office or, uh, you know, and so forth. So there is a criteria for every kind of um, use for every space. Um, and then this, the, the hard science one also addresses glare, you know, how do you prevent glare? How do you create uh, uniformity ratios that, you know, that help us with those uh, physiological, you know, aspects that we talked about, like the adaptation, uh, especially for, um, for older uh, individuals and accommodation and all these things. Um, an example would be if you're out in the daylight, uh, which as we talked about was about, you know, 100,000 lux and you walk into a building how does, you know, uh, you know, depending on your age, how do you, uh, how do you manage for those first few steps within the space? So that first entry point has to be treated, you know, with, with caution. So, because you're, you're talking about uh, people who are, you know, transitioning from 10,000 or 100,000, you know, lux to a space with um, 200 or 20 lux. So we have to create, lighting has to be designed a certain way to prevent, you know, tripping and falling and for, for comfort, basically, visual comfort, you know, it's, uh, it has to be um, gradual, you know, uh, we have to provide a certain level of light that makes that transition easy. And once they walk into the lobby, for example, then they're, you know, they start to transition. And also depends on the type of use, if, if it's, you know, if it's a school where there's young children, the transition, you know, is not as um, not I wouldn't say important, but it's not um, the requirements are less uh, as opposed to uh, a senior living home, for example, or senior, um, basically the age of individuals and 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 the amount of activity, how much you know uh, activity happens at that entrance. This is just one aspect of those uh, physiological um, criteria that we have to keep in mind. And then lastly, there's the soft artistic, artistic approach. And that is not truly grounded in science per se, but rather on um, experiential evidence and uh, some form of studies. Um, and or this is the what we talked about earlier uh, being the psychological components, you know, the composition and adding attraction, adding interest, you know, treating the peripheral vision, creating, you know, um, uh, various, you know, um, hierarchies with lighting in a space. Um, so, you know, the true art of lighting design is, you know, is a successful balancing of all these three, the engineering approach, the hard science approach, and the soft approach. Sometimes the only thing you see in the space is the soft artistic approach, but, you know, bear in mind that uh, all the other aspects for in a successful lighting design um, project or um, process, all the other aspects have to be, you know, transparent. You can't even feel them, but you're not feeling discomfort or, um, or, uh, or, you know, experiencing disability glare, basically. Um, so that's the art of lighting. <laughs> um, the uh, design process, you know, um, lighting design scope uh, will be determined by economics how much, you know, money is available for the project. And, you know, after many years of, uh, 
of uh, practice, this always becomes one of the true driving forces of any project. Um, so economics and then schedule. Um, how soon does the building want to be accomplished or completed? And the design team makeup uh, and uh, also the client's level of concern about lighting. Some clients don't care about lighting. Obviously, that's uh, a mistake that, you know, that gets uh, rectified later uh, at a higher uh, expense, obviously. But um, these are the factors that kind of determine the uh, the process and the and the um, and the amount of involvement a lighting designer um, has in a project, and and the flow chart that uh, you're looking at here, and it's also continued on the second next page. Um, this flow chart, oops, um, this represents a full scope of a typical lighting design process. Um, you know, most projects would comprise uh, only of, uh, three to five of these steps. The first step is basically programming, um, inventory of uh, existing conditions. You want to go look at the site or the building, um, establish design goals, what you want to do with the space, and then define the, the priorities and the criteria. What are the biggest challenges that are going to uh, define the design direction? Uh, and then the next stage is schematic. Now we're just going to um, uh, assess the architecture and then come, come up with a preliminary design. And then um, you're gonna get feedback from the client, from the, um, the whole design team, uh, and then finalize your direction in the schematic. And then you have your design development phase, which is uh, now we're actually taking that schematic and uh, assigning real, you know, products and, and layouts to it. We're bringing in, uh, you know, schedules and cut sheets and thinking about controls for the lighting and, um, and using design tools like, you know, calculation software to determine, you know, uh, to iron out all those engineered approach uh, and hard science elements of uniformity and all these things. Um, and then um, start doing the, uh, the very, um, uh, the outline specifications um, for, you know, that kind of um, define the, this, the, the level of design and um, that, it, you know, starting to prep the project towards construction basically and then um the most the the big step of construction documents and that's where everything is put on paper on you know in blueprint we don't do blueprint anymore um just you know designed on paper uh, we do our reflected ceiling plans our elevations our details and then everything is specified in utmost detail and uh, cut sheets are defined and and now we're getting uh, realistic budgets of um, of what the whole process is going to cost, and then uh, bidding happens and uh, construction administration starts. Um, then the contractors take everything and uh, start sending us back submittals and uh, shop drawings and uh, you know there's site visits for any field issues and then and then finally. There's the uh, inspection or, and the punch walks and, you know, comparing the end product to the design intent and, you know, reviewing everything that was built and accepting it or not accepting <laughs> or, you know, demanding corrections. Oops. So, um, and lastly, before we uh, actually, you know, start looking at projects, um, we, we said we're going to look at the seven domains of practice. And um, these are kind of, they're not like the commandments, but, <laughs> but they are the, um, uh, the seven domains. They're um, defined by the CLD, which is a lighting certification program. Uh, they're defined as the core competencies of lighting design for professionals. And uh, they really provide a standard for evaluating the performance of a lighting design project. And these uh, domains are, um, the first, first one is goals and outcomes. You know, what are the goals that you set out to accomplish and 
how is what was what did the outcome look like did you satisfy the goals um you know did you satisfy the the design intent and uh meet the criteria that was set out um collaboration um one thing you learn is that uh a successful design for a successful design collaboration is really key you have to collaborate with all the design team members with the architects the engineers the structural engineers the electrical engineers the plumbing the mechanical uh especially mechanical i learned through my many years uh we're fighting for the same space in the ceiling with mechanical so a lot of collaboration uh, and with the interior designers as well um basically all the design team members uh there has to be a a high level of collaboration. Um, the third domain is ingenuity. Um, you know, uh, projects are tough. <laughs> there is rarely an easy project. Um, and uh, there's a lot of constraints. Uh, so ingenuity is, you know, how did you innovate in this design? Um, how did you, you know, uh, address budget problems or schedule problems you know sometimes you have enough time to produce a project sometimes you don't um how do you work around these different um requirements um and then number four is synthesis which is integration of the technical and aesthetical lighting elements uh number five is science and you know it takes us back to those physiological uh principles uh, applying those principles of light successfully in your, how did your project, you know, um, how did, how did you apply those principles to meet your project criteria? Um, number six is stewardship. And this is, you know, have, is your project a champion of the environment of well-being? you know, um, like if your project catered to, um, circadian health, for example, or uh, if your project is, uh, you know, there's ways to, um, for a project to be more sustainable. What have you done for your project to be more sustainable? Have you, uh, you know, tackled, have you gone above and beyond the energy code requirements? Have you designed to code or have you gone beyond that? Um, have you sourced materials locally? You know, there's a lot of ways to do things. And then lastly, and, you know, this is um, a really important one, is human experiences. Um, and this is just, you know, you know, evoking wonder in a space with lighting design. How have you affected people positively, um, people that experience your project? And these are the seven domains. So now we will um, start looking at uh, the first project. Um, we call this a lantern in the dark. Um, uh, a, a resort that's called the Lodge at Edgewood, Tahoe. Um, this is a lakeside lodge that combines the rustic West with nature inspired modern resort luxury. Um, the lighting program was tasked with uh, seamlessly expressing this pairing of, you know, rustic American West with uh with modern and uh nature inspiration um the domain the first domain that we are reviewing here is stewardship um this resort uh, sits over half a mile of uh lake tahoe shores um so the lodge actually falls within the jurisdiction of a an environmental agency called the trpa it's um, a very stringent environmental protection agency. It aims at limiting the impacts of tourism and logging on um, on overgrowth and overgrowth on the uh, on the lake's environment. Um, this was actually the first project of its kind directly on the lake, and uh, so the you know uh, naturally the the resort's biggest challenge was you know the ability to achieve the design intent of being this uh you know luxury resort while satisfying the uh, strict ordinances of the trpa and this has included you know constraints to light trespass you can't like cannot trespass into the environment outside of the uh, 
the footprint of the building. And uh, you cannot have direct view of light sources. Um, and you cannot, um, um, and for, uh, oh, you cannot have flashing or changing intensity of light, which, you know, it wasn't Las Vegas. We weren't <laughs> doing any of that. Um, <clears throat> directional lighting was not allowed to project above the horizontal. So you had to aim lighting down. And if, um, if you know, uh, you see in the photo, we had some up lighting. So uh, we took advantage of the um, a large um, overhand to kind of capture the up light. Um, so, you know, with such limitations in place, it was necessary to approach the facade lighting uh, in a different way. So um, we exploited the expansive windows framing the great room and the uh, we uplit the interior cathedral ceilings that you see up there. Um, and that created sort of a lantern effect against the blue sky uh, backdrop. Basically, the interior lighting merged into the facade composition. So that's how we, you know, we used interior to uh, provide exterior lighting or exterior interest. This is the inside of the lantern, <laughs> um, uh, the great room. So the design aims at immersing guests into this picturesque serenity of the lake and the surroundings by bringing the outdoor experience indoors and then overlaying it with warmth and comfort. Um, architectural luminaires, you know, you can't see, you can't see them barely. Um, they were all concealed, they were indirect, or they were miniature, and uh, they're designed to perform their uh, to perform the task very discreetly and quietly, and allowing the uh, the rustic interior designers luminaires, the ones you see here, uh, they're really just adding sparkle. They're not lighting the rooms. Um, they're just the you know small sources of sparkle, and uh, just the whole the whole composition added to the ambiance. And um, this is a project where color temperature was important. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to um, evoke that warm feeling. So um, most of the lights were um, a, a, a very warm 2700 Kelvin, which is what you're seeing here. And then that was also layered in with the interior design um, uh, pendants, those decorative pendants, uh, those were 2200 Kelvin, which is very close or very similar to uh, candlelight. And the two kind of worked together and, and, and really complemented the earthy finishes of the interior and, uh, you know, added to the warmth of the space. This was just a detail showing, um, uh, you know, a sketch showing the detailing of the cove at the for the cathedral feeling uh, ceiling, um, and you know the the number of iterations. Uh, it went through four or five iterations after construction started, and um, all these adjustments had to be made because of field conditions or because of you know the product had to be value engineered because of cost or, you know, or revised because of lead time uh, issues. This is another view of the, um, the other side of the great room. Um, you'll see meticulous detailing of the ceiling coves. You'll see uplighting, backlighting, wall grazing, and even shadow making, which is not very visible here. But all of these are experienced throughout the resort. And, um, in addition to that, all the public area luminaires, they tie into a centralized control system, which uh, with secondary local controls. Uh, and this, you know, help optimize the energy efficiency. And because of that, code requirements were exceeded by 33%. And uh, the, the, uh, the project achieved a lead silver rating. Um, another, um, view of the project of a different uh, space. This is the reception area. Again, we're looking at all the warmth and comfort, you know, um, as you're coming from the outside, all the snow, of the, the cold weather. Um, you see a soft graze articulating um, the intricate carvings. There's an intricate carved, carved stone behind the reception wall um, that's being grazed, and then uh, by contrast, a more pronounced graze of light 
on the, uh, the sculptural wood uh, partition here and uh, add some cove lighting to kind of uh, add a layer of ambient light and just, you know, add to the composition of the scene. Shadow making. So this, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't tell from the uh, photos on the project, but this project was on an extremely low budget. Um, and the, um, we had to resort to out of the box approaches to the corridor lighting. That, that's where the, the least amount of money wanted to be spent on the corridors. Um, the original concept was going to be, you know, part of bringing that outside in and the nature inspiration. It was going to be these, you know, very um, uh, forest inspired light and shadow projections, uh, you know, on the walls. But, you know, the budget just did not allow for that. So we just resorted to um, having um, accent lights tucked into cavities in the ceiling, and then um, the cavity was covered with ornamental ironwork. And, you know, we just directed the light at the walls and st strategically. And, um, and that not only became the lighting in the corridors, it became the artwork. So this was how low budget <laughs> um, and the budget was saved. Um, I call this slide the ugly. <laughs> this is everything above the ceiling that you know people never experience. But um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we were kind of fighting for space above the ceiling with mechanical, and the ducts kept uh, you know popping up. Um, you know, everywhere we looked. Uh, almost every single light fixture had to be moved. Uh, this was a uh, fitness room. And um, in the end, we, you know, this, you know, irregular layout, we kind of tweaked it a little bit and it became kind of a random looking uh, stripes of light, which actually worked. So um, that was solved. Uh, and then, you know, this is another, um, area of the project here where not a single light fixture location, these are little recessed down lights, every single one of them had to move because of conflicts in the ceiling. And uh, project were, um, you know, uh, in addition to the budget concerns uh, and the schedule, <clears throat> the construction site difficulties added a real level of complexity to the, um, to the project. Um, the, the region experienced the second wettest season in 122 years. Um, the schedule obviously was severely impacted by flooding and snow. And then at the same time, opening day was could not be delayed because there was a you know highly publicized celebrity golf championship that was um, you know slated to take place at the resort. So opening day stayed where it is. And, you know, even though the project was shut down for months because of uh, flooding and snow. So uh, really um, the uh, trades were overlapping and RFIs were coming daily. Uh, products were, you know, sourced from different locations and specifications were changed because everything had to arrive faster. And uh, basically construction administration was a true test of collaboration. So that's another <laughs> uh, of the domains of lighting design. You know, you know, beyond the ugly, this is what, you know, you would experience today. Um, every, every part of the project was, you know, uh, tackled with uh, extreme detail. Um, <clears throat> the spa lounge, you know, the one you see here, that space was, you know, um, one of the few spaces that was lit completely with decorative lighting with, a, you know, um, a few perimeter uh, elements in the backdrop. And that's it for the, uh, for the lantern in the dark. Our next project is uh, called Pacific Gate and it's in downtown San Diego, California. And uh, this is a very different style of project. Um, it's one that is completely inspired by the ocean. 
and uh, the building footprint takes the shape of waves and interlocking curves like a seashell. Um, so the site and the, the podium levels on this tower, uh, this is a mixed use residential tower. Um, they, they stack like architectural waves basically simulating the appearance of the, the coastline, the California coastline here. A white stripe on the exterior, uh, that one delineates the uh, ellipsoidal building form and highlights the 41 story height of the tower, effectively uh, redefining the San Diego skyline. The curvature of this building is reinforced basically by the lighting composition. And you see here on the right, uh, the golden earth toned curved wall at the Port Cochere is highlighted from underwater accent lights. And it kind of draws visitors into the lobby, which we'll see next. This is the main lobby. Um, you know, the vision for Pacific Gate was to indulge residents in an upscale lifestyle with both oceanfront and urban offerings. So the, uh, the lighting, the residential portion of the project was executed with hospitality-like refinement. And uh, high-end finishes provide the elevated aesthetic, but also tie the building to its core ocean-inspired concepts. So uh, back to the lobby here, the undulating curved wall um, uh, made of glass, these are grazed in a certain way to simulate waves here. And, and then opposite from that, the concave wood panels, um, uh, there's a, a concave wood paneled walls on the opposite side. They're, uh, they're softly uplit from the uh, in-ground recess lighting. And uh, the walls had metal trims that catch this subtle illumination, creating some balance against the, the highly illuminated uh, wave wall. Uh, and then you also see in this uh, scene, you'll, uh, you'll see uh, three large interlocking rings of light that draw your eyes up to the, you know, 24 foot ceiling. And uh, these are also mirrored uh, with brass circle, brass circles on the, uh, that's embedded in the terrazzo floor. If you can see that, I'm not sure if it's very visible, but um, and then, you know, so these are the accents in the space, but the real work is being done by the, uh, these kind of discrete downlights. These are actually lighting up the whole space and the rest is kind of complementing and accenting the environment. Another view of the lobby. Um, budget, believe it or not, budget was a major concern for this project and the client. And um, the design was, you know, far from simple. Um, so here, the lighting team really worked closely with the design build contractor uh, and the owner and the architect. Uh, they really worked closely together. Uh, we procured uh, value engineered alternatives to, um, you know, to uh, lighting systems that would have cost a lot more. Uh, and improvised also on installation, and we'll see that in the next slide, um, which ultimately lowered the costs and maintained the, we were able to achieve the effects that we, we set out to, um, to design, to provide, and we were able to do them, uh, you know, without breaking the budget. An example of that is the facade that we just looked at, you know, that soon to be iconic stripe was uh, an evolutionary fruit of this collaboration. It was, it started out as an architectural installation and then it turned into uh, something that you could kind of tackle by through a glazing detail and it went into the glazing contractor and to provide that detail while, you know, we provided the light. Um, these are just the elevator lobbies, you know, just showing the level of detail um, you know, um, each elevator lobby had multiple layers of light. You have your task downlighting, but that's not kind of, uh, it's, it's doing the most work, but it's not really the focus of the space. And then you have your uh, perimeter, which kind of highlights the peripheral vision of the, you know, or per perimeter of the room. And then there's always a focal point in the scene, whether it's the backlit marble wall or the uh, front lit um, art 
uh, artistic uh, installation in the back wall here. Um, the corridor, um, corridor lighting, that was another res in, uh, result of cost reduction efforts. So, you know, the intent was to illuminate the residential corridors. Typically, you, you know, a project will just use down lights to light these corridors, but this wanted to be an, a higher level of design. We wanted to just um, indirectly light the whole corridor system in the building. Uh, but obviously, um, perimeter lighting costs a lot more money than, you know, simple down lights. Uh, and repeating that on 41 floors was going to be a huge uh, financial impact uh, or budget impact on the, on the project. So again, innovation, uh, we went ahead and, and used a, a surface luminaire that we um, that was tweaked so that it'll you know satisfy the energy requirements and also cost and uh, and aesthetics and we had the um, we collaborated with the architect to build a slot in the ceiling so that the fixture just tucks in there as opposed to creating this uh, complex perimeter lighting which is um, as I mentioned a very costly installation so we were able to achieve kind of the look that we were um, setting out to achieve. And we did that for 50% of the cost. So save the client 50% on the corridors. Um, so this, this 41 story glass tower is just more than uh, a visual marvel on the waterfront on Pacific uh, Boulevard. The building is an enormous, enormous architectural mass um, on the uh, on PCH in San Diego, and with such size comes much responsibility, uh, responsibility to neighbors and to the environment surrounding the building. So architectural lighting was carefully selected to minimize the impacts on both the city and their natural habitats. Um, the lighting is controlled through a central dimming system that allows for programming to be deployed to, kind of, to lessen the nighttime impacts. So the, uh, the light levels kind of decrease as, you know, as the later it gets at night or it shuts off completely. And, um, and it dims variably along the length to address any concerns from residents or any neighboring buildings. Um, and then, uh, or even uh, the San Diego airport, which is nearby. And on to the, uh, the last project, the third project, uh, the, Griffin, the Griffin on Spring. Um, this is a project located in downtown Los Angeles at the intersection of uh, Los Angeles's historical core and the fashion district. Um, it's a 24 story mixed use high rise um, building. Um, the design had to, you know, being located at that kind of intersection of two um, core areas, it had to blend old with new, and it had to reinterpret historic art deco elements with simpler contemporary lines. And the lighting challenges included reinforcing this, uh, these design influences and aiding the nighttime revitalization efforts of the historic area in downtown while at the same time maintaining a calm oasis-like and modern environment for the residents. Again, all with a very limited budget. <laughs> you see a theme here? <laughs> um, so um, the first element of the project is this uh, prominent corner, um, corner facade here. This is uplit with precision, you know, using a miniature four inch uplights that have that you know um, that cast a seven degree spotlight uh, using minimal you know I'll say 1100 lumens that's kind of like the same power as a small downlight in a in a corridor um, we're just using it very strategically and we're using a very precise optic to to get you know the most effect for the smallest amount of energy um, each one of those four inch um, cubic uplights will cast light for 40 feet uh, along that facade and then it picks up uh, a second row of fixtures picks up. 
basically, this repeats for a total height of 150 feet. Um, and this, uh, with these fixtures, we're just highlighting these uh, precast concrete panels. And, and this really reinforces the, the vertical lines of the architecture. Um, and then the simple cubic geometry of the, the miniature light fixtures, they really just blend into the background. So they're not, they don't have a presence. They, you just see the effect. Uh, and then smaller facade details on the south um, and then on the east are both accentuated using even smaller 2.9 inch uh, spotlights that, that use seven watts. Of, uh, of lighting. Um, and then the beams are, you know, um, create these very sharp uh, 20 foot throws up the buildings and create um, these, uh, uh, they highlight the architectural elements and we'll see them in the next slides. And then this vertical, you know, articulation is kind of crowned at the top with a color splash of uh, RGB, red, green, blue, color changing lights that, um, that highlight or accent the mechanical screens on the, on the roof. South, south facade, and this is kind of where you see the old and the new blending. Um, this is a facade that engages the pedestrian sidewalk so, and the retail activity in all this uh, lower level. Uh, this is 8th Street. So um, we used a modern interpretation of a custom art deco sconce um, that kind of, as we said, in, engages the pedestrian uh, activity on the street. And it, we fitted that with a custom up down LED module that you know, provided these subtle highlights to the architecture. You'll see these uh, little articulations here above and below the fixture. So you know, everything was, uh, done very precisely. And um, obviously the, the high light level from these sconces, um, it, you know, it helps address the well-known safety issues or safety concerns of the uh, downtown LA area. And which is a kind of a, a main aspect, one of the main aspects of the revitalization efforts of the, uh, of the neighborhoods. And this is the East facade uh, this is what we were looking at earlier. These are the very, the seven tiny miniature seven watt uh, spotlights that, you know, accent the reveals in the um, GFRC panels and also highlight the trims on the, on the wall. Um, and by contrast, you know, um, the, the private terraces on the seven uh, ninth and the roof levels, these, you know, are set to, to provide a serene you know, atmosphere that transports the residents from the bustle of the downtown LA city below into a quiet, quiet um, park ambiance, basically. Uh, paths and decks and planting are all softly uplit with uh, minimum uplight glare for residents. Everything had to be placed so that, you know, uh, residents looking down will not be, you know, uh, faced with the, um, having to look at actual, you know, uh, light sources. <clears throat> um, it may not be clear here, but um, modified light bollards were integrated into the handrail to, uh, to maintain egress lighting. Again, remember the engineered approach versus the design approach. Um, and this, again, this was also a cost cutting measure because um, the alternative was to uh, use handrail integrated lighting, which was very costly. So we just resorted to um, low cost budget uh, bollards that were uh, cleverly integrated, you know, and installed within the handrail system. Um, this was the interior of the, uh, the lobby, uh, the main lobby. Um, the lighting, the architectural lighting is very subtle. Again, it's, it's just out there to do the work and then uh, the decorative lighting kind of um, captures the scene um, and provide an ambient layer of light as well. Um, 
the there's a lot of coordination that happened here. Uh, the lamping for all the decorative lights. Um, so we had we wanted to maintain a 2700 Kelvin color temperature, which is what you see in the down lights. Uh, but all these glowy uh, globes, they're opal white, milky white uh, globes. Um, if you put a 2700 color source in those, the effect will be a much whiter um, uh, result. So we had to kind of color, uh, use uh, much warmer colors inside the globe so that you know when the light passes through the diffuser, it looks like it's 2700 Kelvin. So even the decorative lighting um, had to be uh, maneuvered to kind of, uh, uh, to, to fit with the composition of the room. Um, this was the vaulted ceiling and the elevator lobby, and this is um, this is another area where meticulous detailing uh, of the cove light uh, place. Um, the luminaire is angled at a specific angle uh, to avoid excessive brightness on the walls, just so that everything is nice and soft. Uh, and then the decorative metal trim at the edge of the cove had to be uh, a specific height that was uh, designed to not cut off the, the main energy of the light so that we don't have harsh shadows or um, a harsh line of shadows. So it created this very, very soft effect. Um, and then one of the advantages of this is that, you know, with a very soft cove, you're not getting reflections on the floor, on the very shiny floor here. Um, so kind of kept the space calm and, you know, a decorative fixture is hung in the middle. And um, basically you're having this diffuse indirect light and a decorative light. Again, um, everything involves layers of light. So, and, and again, this technique kind of um, uh, brought to life the modern interpretation of a historic architecture. another area of the interior. <clears throat> um, this is the pool deck looking at it from the 24th floor. Um, you see the pool deck is, you know, lit uh, extremely uniformly. Uh, you'll see some paths are brighter than others. These are the egress path, again, the engineered approach. Uh, there's sliding requirements that, you know, require that these paths are a certain light level, but still it wasn't a huge contrast for the rest of the pool area. Um, there's a lot of uniformity. And one thing you notice is that you don't see any light source or maybe just one here needed to be tweaked, but um, everything is lit um, so that, you know, the people looking from, from above are not bothered by any um, glary source of light and are uh, able to enjoy the view without, you know, uh, experiencing any harsh distractions. And this is the, uh, that mechanical um, roof uh, lighting, colored lighting at the, um, at the crown. Um, as we mentioned, uh, project budget concerns were addressed throughout the, throughout the design process. And uh, for facade lighting, this was tackled, um, as we mentioned earlier, using a very limited quantity of high performance luminaires, uh, strategically placed for maximum effect for the money. So we used very high quality fixtures, but we used very few of them. And we were able to achieve the um, desired effect without, again, without breaking the bank. Um, and then in addition to that, maximum energy savings and light pollution concerns are simultaneously addressed by exterior lighting control systems, which offer um, late night curfew mode and uh, where all the upper facade lighting systems are shut off. And then the, the programmable RGB luminaires also dim down during this uh, curfew mode. So students, let's, uh, let's get your questions ready. You can raise your hand or you can type them into the chat. I have a few questions. So I'll start with 
with one or two. And meanwhile, please add them to the chat or raise your hand and we'll go in that order. Um, but I think my first question, Salwa, is uh, what got you into this career? Uh, very good question. <laughs> um, my whole life, I thought I was going to be an architect. And I went to architecture school and I got my bachelor's degree. And I, you know, during, uh, I went to um, grad school for architecture as well. And during that study, um, I came across uh, a lighting design course. It was my first lighting design course. And, um, you know, deep down my, you know, with all my architectural um, instincts, I, I knew I had these, uh, this kind of attraction to science and physics and optics and, and just, you know, experiencing that lighting course, you know, brought the two together, basically the, uh, the science and the architecture, art and science. <laughs> and it, it, to me, felt like this is it, you know, um, this is what I've uh, probably wanted to do my whole life and I didn't know it. <laughs> And um, I never went into architecture practice. I immediately uh, went into lighting design and never looked back. <laughs> wow. Well, you still get to work with architects, right? And Absolutely. interior designers. What, yes. what's, what is that interaction like? Is, uh, is it, are there situations where you have a client and you all meet together to kind of debrief on a planned project? Or mm -hmm. is, it, is there kind of an order or how does it work? Um, so, first of all, and then, uh, that meeting will, uh, will be, inf you know, informed on, um, what the project needs are. And, uh, obviously, um, I've, if I've been called into the meeting, they want lighting design. Obviously it's, um, a certain level of client that recognizes the importance of lighting design, um, to a project. Um, you know, you can have the best looking space, but if you're not lighting it properly you're you know uh, you're not seeing it properly so um you know that's when we start talking about what do, how, how, what do we want to create here what how what do we want to um what is the composition what do we want people to feel in this space and you know um and the conversation starts whether it's with the client or the architect or both of them uh, and sometimes the interior designer as well. So we all kind of collaborate and have a session, kind of a, a design session. Then, you know, um, once we get a, an initial direction, we go back and, and kind of expand on that and then come back again for feedback. So really the, 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 the largest um, portion of our design process happens in schematics. The rest is kind of just implementing and, and coordinating with the different disciplines. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions, so I'll kind of read them out. They're in the chat here. So first is a comment, such beautiful work. So thanks for the comment there. Thank and you. And then we have, we have another comment here uh, and question. It says, I feel like I can always find a way to add another layer of light into a space even if it's unnecessary. Have you ever found out that too many layers of light can make a space chaotic? Is there such a thing as too many layers of light? Yes. Yes, again, it's um um it's it's subjective, but you you know as as I mentioned earlier, it's um you know experiential evidence basically. Um you um, you want your basic elements have to be satisfied. You want to create focus. You want to create things that support that focus. Um, too many things to look at creates confusion, and it you know basically creates uh, discomfort, psychological discomfort. But when you have a kind of a, a really um, uh, you know clear hierarchy. I would call it hierarchy. Um, so use the layers to create that hierarchy. It could be two layers, it could be three, it could be more if the space affords it, uh, you know, visually. 
But in the end, the composition has to have hierarchy. You have to have your focal point. You have to have your peripheral. How are you addressing all of these? And that's really the, the true measure. It's not, you know, uh, it doesn't, it's not really the number of layers, but, you know, what is the composition and uh, what is the hierarchy in that composition? Fantastic. That was a great question. And I'm sure that helps also with budget. If there's things that need to get cut or things like that, you right. continue on that, the concept mm -hmm. behind the lighting to figure out what, what's most important, what needs to be there no matter what. Right. All right. So excellent question. We have another, uh, we have a comment here. It says, yes, I actually have a few ideas for a dream house I'm making after viewing some of the projects. I didn't think if shadow lighting for the hallways, but it's pretty cool effect. And I love the ambience lighting it gives, especially if you use it correctly. Yeah, that was really interesting. That's the first time I really thought about that, but just the lighting designer designing the shadows. And it was pretty interesting how you were talking about, you know, using that in relationship with budgets and things like that, not just for an effect, but also to create an effect without something physical as well, you know, so mm -hmm. really neat. Um, let's see. Next question is, how do you move from businesses to schools, et cetera? And how does your thinking have to change for each of these spaces? Um, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's easy because, you know, the design revolves around, you know, who's using the space. So you immediately transform yourself to the user. You, you, you're looking at things uh, regardless whether you're designing a hospital or a classroom or a conference room or a spa. Um, you're focused on the use of the space and on the user and then the experience. So you'll switch your mind immediately to uh, what do what does my user want in this room, or how can I make their you know uh, how can I influence them positively? So again, it's it's a process. It's first you know you first you put in your engineering uh, for the space uh, requirements, engineering requirements, and then your science requirements, and then the third one is how do you um, what else can you do to um, to improve on on on, um, on on the feeling or the human experience of the of this, uh, the occupant of the space? So the principles don't change. I mean, the way uh, the the layers or the uh, the um, the type of fixtures or the colors of lighting will will change, but the basic principles will remain the same. Great. I imagine, yeah, no, I imagine that uh, you, you were mentioning the types of activities and things like that happen. Right. So you're kind of keeping that in mind as you go through and, and assess these principles and uh, right. work with your creativity and your concepts. Uh, what, you know, piggybacking off of that question, uh, what, what, you know, what, what type of lighting design do you enjoy the most? I mean, what types of uh, projects, you know, residential business, um, uh, faith related what, what is it um i would have to say hospitality because you know um human experiences are at the core of the lighting design process and uh it's kind of like in hospitality you're you know it's like a playground for experiences and um uh, unfortunately they are the most difficult to achieve because you know no matter what the project is, if it's hospitality, uh, the budget is very, very, very strict. <laughs> and, you know, um, it's kind of counterintuitive. You're designing a luxury space. Why is the budget so constricted? But that's kind of a reality of, of things. But um, so they're, they're challenging. And, and, and uh, you know, it's a personal challenge to be able to um, achieve what you uh, and, and create these experiences on a budget and make it look like it didn't, it cost a lot more. <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah. I was thinking about that because this is one of those professions where conceptually you, you come up with these ideas based on these lighting principles and the effect that you wanna have. And, and, but then 
you see that through to execution. You're overseeing everything that's happening. You're figuring out some of, a lot of the issues that happen in the field. And in the end, you know, you walk through and you see the effects, you know. So really with with a lot of these projects, it seems like you are seeing it through from, yep. from these concepts mm -hmm. to figuring out all those tough parts at the end of like, how do we actually make this work and get the effect that we're telling our client we're going to give you, you know, that vibe. So that's really neat. And I have to say the best part is going out, you know, going out there after it's completed and it's been inspected and and uh, punch walked and uh, everything is done and corrected and taking those photos and then going back and looking at your first, you know, uh, sketches and uh, drawing board for the uh, at the schematic phase of the project. This is the best part, you know, seeing things come into fruition, um, you know, within maybe a couple of years or three, four years, or sometimes shorter, shorter, uh, shorter time, time frame, especially if it's um, an interior pro project, you know, or a model or something. Um, yeah, seeing things come to life is, um, is a really rewarding experience. Okay, so, all right, so there's some excellent questions so far. So here's the next one. Uh, how, how often, do you visit the site of a project? And the second part is, do you do rendering so you can work remotely or is it a lot of times experimenting in person with the lights? Um, the first part of the question, um, the site visits um, usually for uh, construction administration once the, 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 the project starts uh, construction. Um, if you know, you don't have to visit it often because a lot of the issues are communicated um, via RFIs, requests for information, or, um, uh, I mean, obviously if, if it's needed, you'll go up to the site, but um, usually the, you know, every project has a contract that involves, um, that kind of states the number of site visits for, you know, for punch walks and, you know, acceptance of the building and all of that. So it's, it, it all depends on the budget of the project because, you know, obviously it's time spent uh, driving up to or traveling to the project site. Um, so yeah, I would say about, you know, to, in total about four times. Okay, and so the second part of the question is, do you do rendering so you can work remotely, uh, you know, in the office on the projects, or is it a lot of times experimenting in person with the lights? Like, do you do um, prototypes, things like that? All of them, all of the above. <laughs> so, um, so we uh, the first phase would be renderings, and it could be hand renders, or you know, if you want to test the intensity of a certain light, you know, on a certain building or a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, Vista, um, we would use uh, rendering programs, or they would also be used for, you know, for our schematic presentations. Um, but we also, that, that has to be kind of um, uh, accompanied by actually, uh, for example, in this project here, we're still looking at those small four inch fixtures. We actually brought ordered those from the manufacturer and they they you know they uh, give us samples that they take back and we have to kind of create a um, or find something that uh, is uh, comparable to this you know uh, two foot or three foot wide uh, concrete panel that's you know 40 foot high uh, so basically we tested that and uh, even when you know when the construction started, um, they, uh, we took that same fixture and we had the electrician kind of mock it up. So we, you know, it was always a, a test and check and reach. So, yeah, so we do actually, and it doesn't matter if we're working remote or in the office, we're more in the office these days, but, you know, like everybody else, we worked remotely, uh, the past couple of years and, uh, yeah, we would order samples. To, at our homes and, you know, we find the spot that kind of replicates the, uh, the scene we want to create, or we would go out to a, a project site and, you know, mock, mock up things there and, um, 
yeah, so it's always a combination of, you know, a program, software, hand sketches or renderings, and then an actual product mockups. All right, so thank you for that question. And let's continue on. So next question is besides budget and other restrictions, what are other difficulties you run into when you start a new project? So what are the other difficulties you run into when you start a new project? Um, I want to say um, understanding what the client wants, because um, they may want something or they may uh, not know that they want something or they may not be able to communicate you know, exactly what, what they're trying to achieve. So um, they have something in their mind, in their vision, but they're not communicating. it. So we have to kind of, uh, kind of lead them to, to, to um, reveal that. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, um, we don't, I don't want to say don't agree with that, or, you know, we kind of want to advise them very politely or diplomatically that that's not going to work. That's not what you want. You want this, you know. Um, I would say that, you know, managing that relationship is, um, is a difficult task. So I imagine there's a lot of uh, question asking and clarification yes. and things like mm -hmm. that, just to get them to kind of maybe right. say for themselves for the first time, what is it that they're really looking for? Right. Well, okay, next question is, what are your thoughts on light pollution reducing the visibility of the night sky? Is it healthy? Absolutely. And, and you know, we're, we're living in a time where this is very easy to do. So, um, you know, um, LEDs are, you know, a lot easier to control. They are, you know, they are brighter than our, you know, traditional sources, but they're also very easy to control. And um, they're, uh, I think there was a, um, a, an image that was circulating on the internet uh, a few years, a couple of years ago. Uh, it showed kind of uh, where we are now, you know, in, in terms of sky glow versus 1912, and it's day and night, literally. So even though, you know, we're still, you know, uh, trying to do better, but I think we are at, at a really, really um, good, you know, uh, spot right now. And, and a lot of this is just street lighting, controlling street lighting. Um, I think Los Angeles has probably 80, over 80% 80 of the, the street lights in Los Angeles have been retrofitted. And um, obviously there's still more work to do there. Um, we wanna make sure that the, the sources are not glary to look at, but in terms of night sky, I think it's a huge improvement. And uh, we now have the tools and the means to, to preserve the night sky. All right, let's see, uh, next question. What are your favorite magazines or social media pages that you like to look at for inspiration? I've always enjoyed the process of selecting lighting solutions for my projects, but sometimes struggle to think of new ideas. Um, um, nothing, you know, crazy. It's just uh, for inspiration, I'll go to Pinterest or, um, there are a few websites that um, that have um, collections of lighting images, and uh, sometimes there's proprietary websites that kind of create these uh, libraries. and And a lot of times, large firms would have an internal library. Uh, anytime a project is completed, or you know, any image uh, comes across that you know that's uh, you know deemed uh, useful for something, uh, it'll get added to the library. So, you know, a combination of all of this, our own library, uh, certain um, image libraries, and then, you know, websites like that, like Pinterest, and um, I don't want to say Instagram, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a combination of all, basically. 
And also some manufacturers, uh, lighting manufacturers have their own um, application images for projects using their products. So they would go and photograph these projects and, and keep, you know, um, uh, have their own sort of slideshows or libraries of uh, photos. So those are also very useful. And in the early stages, do you develop uh, almost like mood boards, a collection of like types of luminaires that would fit into a space or how do you organize or kind of filter into that? Do you start like with some visual examples or how does that work with communicating um, that? So oh, um, we, 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 um, once we start to, you know, figure, you know, understand the direction the design is going, uh, we, we prepare a, um, a schematic package, we call it. And it's almost our a lighting designer's version of a mood board. So we would, you know, it would include, you know, um, different um, uh, compositions of light that we want to create. Uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a kind of a very um, undetailed plan of the space. Um, and then we'll have, you know, kind of uh, little numbers showing, you know, in this area, I'm, I'm doing this mood board. Or in this area, I'm doing this kind of scene. So that kind of helps communicate our ideas and whatever, you know, uh, and that gets reviewed by the client, by the design team. And it becomes kind of a platform for back and forth on the design process. All right, uh, let's see, let's go to the next question. How do you go about calculating the amount of lighting needed and brightness for space? So there's the old you know, hand method, but I don't think I know a lighting designer that uses that calculation method anymore. Um, fortunately, we have uh, software that lighting software that you know um, every light fixture out there from a reputable manufacturer has something called an IES file, which is a you know um, a file that kind of uh, carries the attribute of how the light and the intensity um, is distributed outside of the fixture. So um, we bring it in into a 3D model and we, you know, we study the positions based on these IES files. And it gives us a very realistic either interpretation of the space or calculation of like, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, we have to uh, comply with local codes, with um, energy codes, with um, um, international building code requirements for egress or even task, you know, our responsibility is uh, to um, provide certain task uh, lum illuminances uh, for, you know, um, I mean, we don't, to, we don't usually publish that, but, you know, but we, for every space, we have to have studied it and calculated it and, uh, you know, the accenting and all of that stuff is kind of, um, um, you know, it's uh, it's it's supplemental, but the the main uh, lighting sources or that you know that provide the base layer is uh, is always calculated, and there's uh, you know multiple sources of uh, or softwares for calculation. Uh, the most famous one is called AGI. And then there's another one called Visual. They basically um, you plug these files in, you bring in your uh, your you know plan, you create a 3D model representing the space, the ceiling heights, the colors on the walls, and all of that, and then you run the calculations. You mentioned um, lighting and the connection with well-being. Mm -hmm. earlier on in the uh, presentation. Yes. Um, that must be really critical for spaces related to recovery and mm -hmm. hospitals and things like that. Could you tell us a little bit about that or just some of your thoughts Absolutely. about that subject? Yeah. So, you know, um, I did a, you know, I did many years of uh, doing healthcare lighting and, uh, you know, it's, it's getting better now, but you know a lot of the projects I encountered. Um, you know, the uh, for example, a patient room 
um, is lit in a certain way uh, that is driven primarily by the budget. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real shame that, you know, um, you know, the patient's well-being is, uh, is not such a high factor, um, you know, in determining the design of the room. But, um, but that's changing because now it's, um, you know, how fast the patient recovers is also a financial decision. And how, you know, um, the level of recovery of a patient, um, you know, hospitals today are, uh, are accountable for, you know, for the uh, satisfaction of the patients, basically. Uh, in fact, sometimes uh, for, uh, like for Medicare, you know, recipients, for example, I believe that they, the hospital, if the patient has an adverse experience, the, pay, the hospital will not get paid by Medicare. So it's kind of accountability is really key now. And that's driving the hospital design to, um, uh, hospital designs to, you know, to be more uh, in the human experience uh, kind of realm. And that means, you know, the color temperature that a patient, so a patient is, uh, you know, a lot of times they're in the hospital for a long time, they get, you know, delirious and, um, you know, they need something that kind of corrects that, you know, clock, biological clock that's dependent on the the color of light. I mean, our biological, we're not, we can't see it. So those cells that experience the, the, the changes in, in color temperature or in uh, um, the spectrum of light, uh, those are not vision cells. Those are just, you know, um, they're, they're sensitive to light, but they're not vision. So it's not even something that we see, but our brain knows so I, our brain knows from the composition of a light that you can tell it that, oh, now it's like 6 a.m. It's uh, sunlight is, you know, mixed with this amber color and, uh, and then it starts to get bluer and bluer until it gets to noon um, where it's kind of uh, gotten to a certain color temperature. And then after that, it starts to uh, get lower again until it gets to sunset and then, you know, um, uh, and then it becomes dark. So that's what our brain wants to uh, experience. And if you're in a hospital for a week and you're subjected to this one color of light and you know, you're, 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 it's very confusing. And, and that confusion, remember we, it was associated with, um, with not getting well sooner and with also uh, having adverse effects in you know in recovery and even developing other diseases, so and 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 not just hospitals, uh, we're talking about office buildings. You know, people are in an office building from eight a.m. to five or six p.m., and they're subjected to this one intense color temperature. Uh, if you can't see outdoors, it's you know, uh, it it kind of ruins that rhythm, that biological rhythm. Um, that's why it's important for even, you know, back to patient rooms, um, having a, a window, having a direct view to the outside, that really helps. Even if the lighting is bad, uh, having that natural source, source is, is key. But, but, but still, it's not enough because, you know, if you're subjected to the wrong color temperature at night, then, you know, your uh, rhythm is, again, messed up because... Um, you're supposed to be experiencing experiencing a certain um, uh, intensity and a certain uh, spectrum of uh, wavelengths at night. Yeah, it's interesting. Even with you know being able to sleep and recovery and the mm -hmm. correlations between that, just that's really interesting. Okay, so let's keep on going here. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. So we have a question. So you you really majored in in architecture, and then you kind of moved into lighting, uh, lighting design. Did you have to go through other education to transition from the architecture to to specifying in lighting design, or did you learn it through the profession, or how, how does it work? Um, I got my start in a um, a lighting design course at uh, in school, and um, that was enough to get me 
to start working as a kind of a junior lighting designer at a lighting design firm um, right after college. And, and really the rest of it is, you know, through the practice. And there are some certifications to get that ensure that, you know, you are um, uh, proficient in all the, uh, the main uh, tenets of the profession. Okay, and then the second part of the question is, do you ever get hands-on by installing your own lights with your projects? Uh, not with my projects because, you know, <laughs> There's insurance that kind of uh, tells us not to do that, <laughs> but um, but I have installed every single light fixture in my home. If cool. that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay. Let's see. Next next question. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because I know a lot of interior designers, and I go into their house or their home, mm -hmm. and they that's their big thing. It's like, okay, I designed these spaces. This is, this is so yeah. intentional. And so this is interesting. A lighting designer. Right. Yes, this is my space. This is my lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Okay. Next question. Um, is there a company to source your lighting fixtures like McMaster Car or Building Hardware? Um, so um, there are um, multiple uh, a, you know, a huge array of lighting manufacturers. One of the things you gain through practice is knowing uh, what manufacturer does what, and uh, that becomes kind of like it becomes kind of a um, kind of a, like an encyclopedia. Of uh, it's not one manufacturer; it's always uh, different. You know, um, those that make interior lighting sometimes are different than those that make exteriors. The ones that make linear lights are different than the ones, ones that make dust, you know, circular spotlights. Um, and there's, these are different than the ones that make light poles for exterior or bollards or, you know, or landscape lighting. So there's a plethora of, uh, of manufacturers and of applications. So um, again, yeah, like I said, it's part of the practice and, and kind of the uh, hands-on knowledge is to know where to go for uh, different products. And then all that falls into your budget. So you kind of- pick Yes, and exactly. And, and then, that. yes. And then for every type of product, there's 20 different companies that make the same similar versions of it. And each one has its own price range. So, and, and that price is driven by the level of quality or the level of precision or the level of, you know, uh, materials used and, you know, and it's all kind of a, you know, a balancing game. Wow, really neat. Okay, so let's see here. We've got another question. It's like we have two more major questions here. So this is a multi-part one. Sure. Uh, when it comes to finished fixtures, like sconces and mm -hmm. pendants, do you pick these or instruct a designer on criteria that fixtures must meet in order to achieve your lighting design? And then they pick the exact fixture. Um, no, we pick the fixture. However, like the exterior finish, that will fall into the, um, the responsibility of the architect or the interior designer. So we, we work like with, so it's a back and forth process. So um, we, you know, we determine the function of the light and uh, the shape of the light, and you know, based on the performance that we uh, we we were trying to achieve, and we come up with a light product, and then you know, we leave everything, we do everything in, in you know in the selection process, and just uh, except for the finish, the exterior finish. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. All right. So um, next question is, uh, do you often revisit previous projects for inspiration for future projects? Um, yeah, absolutely. I uh, sometimes, you know, if a project is uh, within, you know, my uh, travel distance, I would very you very much so go and uh look at it after a couple of years and when you travel do you or go places are you always looking at what the lighting designer was doing what yeah, the architect absolutely. is doing that relationship there and just kind of like <laughs> oh what's this what's that yeah as soon as i walk into a space i look up so it's always uh <laughs> um 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process. You know, walking into a restaurant and just looking up. You know, constantly looking and critiquing every space uh, you walk into. That's kind of. Uh, <laughs> those who are in my company have gotten used to it. So. Um, <laughs> Well, all that work that lighting designers do mm-hmm. to, to set the mood, to create the ambiance, to, you know, facilitate um, the activities and things that happen. And then it was interesting what you're talking about, about that sharp change between, like, for example, with hospitality, mm-hmm. walking from out, outdoors with mm-hmm. a very high lux environment and then going inside and all of a sudden that change and mm-hmm. being able to design for that change in that first experience. Right really interesting. So it was kind of neat what you were talking about um, uh, uh, regarding uh, the Pacific Gate project Mm -hmm. and the effect lighting has on the neighbors. And is that, um, is there kind of like, what what would it be called? Like a environmental assessment or something like that, where you kind of get assessment of, of what's around the space and, you know, you know, it's kind of like knowing your neighbors and just knowing what's around and figuring out how is the lighting going to potentially going to affect, you know, some of these other businesses or other groups. Is that part of the process too, where there's this kind of um, not only the exterior interior lights, but then also the environment around the space? Right. So it, it depends on the type of, pro- the location of the project, first of all, and the type. Because, uh, for example, Pacific Gate, um, it's it's in a downtown of uh, San Diego, so it really is an environment where it's, um, that welcomes you know the hustle and the bustle and you know and uh, bright lights and and al- almost every tower in downtown uh, San Diego in that area has some kind of a light feature. So it wasn't kind of, it wasn't um, unexpected. However, um, the uh, you know we went above and beyond to try and make sure that, you know, um, first of all, the, the immediate neighbors are not bothered by it. And, um, and then we also, we were very aware of the airport, which is uh, not too far. And this, when this project was completed, it was the tallest structure, tallest building in San Diego. So, um, and, and being so close to the airport, that was, a, you know, a huge concern for us and for the owner, um, obviously, um, uh, there, there was a lot of communication back and forth. But then, for other types of projects, uh, yes, sometimes a um, an environmental impact report is required by code. Um, if you're doing something that's flashing or something that's uh, above a certain uh, luminance level, um, yeah. So sometimes it's required. Sometimes you do it out of stewardship, you know, to the environment but largely dependent on the um, location. Well, it's really exciting. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And uh, if you're interested in lighting, come talk to me.